Okay. Uh, hello and uh, welcome to Voices of Hope, Power of Words. It's the fourth session. For those of you who are new to us, uh, Voices of Hope is an organization that fights against bigotry and prejudice with Holocaust and genocide education and remembrance. My name is Pat Kazakoff and I'm your moderator for today. A uh, little bit about me. I am uh, the child of survivors. My mother was liberated from Bergen-Belsen and a little bit of black humor. She used to say that she did the camp tour. <laughs> that was her humor. Um, uh, also, a little fun fact about me, I was one of the original interviewers for Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation, and I happened to have interviewed one of the first people was uh, the president of Voices of Hope, his mother, Tootie Fishman, which is a big coincidence. I didn't know the Fishmans. I didn't know anything. It was just an assignment that I got. But in any case, I'm all, oh yes, and I'm also on the board of Voices of Hope. Today, we are interviewing Gwen Strauss. She wrote the book, The Nine. Uh, by her own admission, she calls herself uh, brave and foolish, uh, both at the same time. Uh, she was born in Haiti. She lived on a boat uh, when she was 17 on a sailboat for a year. She traveled through Tashkent to, uh, to Moscow, through Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, while the Soviet Union was crumbling. That's a little brave, uh, maybe a little foolish, but if you live to tell the story, Gwen, it seems to be all right. Um, she, uh, she's had many, many other adventures. She lived in a monastery uh, in, in Korea. She's lived all over the world. Uh, but now she finds her home in Provence. Uh, during all this time, she also managed to write a book of a poetry, Trail of Stones. And she's most well known for her children's work, uh, Ruth and the Green Book, won <laughs> the most notable middle school prize. And uh, she's had many, many children's books that have been uh, translated all over. <coughs> um, and now, uh, now, um, She's here. We're writing the nine. Uh, Hi, it's lovely and, to be oh, here. I didn't, I didn't. I didn't mention. I didn't mention all the articles that you've written that have been published in the Republic and right. the <laughs> London Sunday Times. I'm, I'm actually. I was actually kind of. A, um. I, I just learned that you did the, the USC Shoah interviews because that that was a big part of um the research I did for this book. Yes, Was yes. That, well, that's why that's why I mentioned it. So yeah. Um. Oh, and she also has three children and they all live in Provence, and a dog called Zola, which I assume is a literary reference to uh, Emile Zola. Yeah, yeah. Am I correct? Is. <laughs> yes, yes. It's my daughter, um, Sophie, who named him Emile Zola. Zola. She now oh, lives oh. in Paris, and she's a, you know, an organizer in Zola fashion. <laughs> So, so, so Gwen, it's good to see you. It's good to meet you. Um, tell me, what is the nine about? Give us a brief overview. Well, basically, it's an it's an escape story. It's a story of uh, nine women who escaped from a Nazi slave labor camp in Leipzig, um, <laughs> and it's the story of nine women um, who are all in their twenties. The youngest at the time is twenty. The oldest is twenty nine. It's a true story. There were six French, uh, two Dutch, and one um, Spanish Spaniard. They um, came from all different socioeconomic groups and different religions. Two of them were Jewish and the rest were not. They were all arrested as political resistance fighters. Well, you know what? You just mentioned the fact that two were Jewish. And I want to tell you, this is this is maybe my personal thing, but I'm, you know, I see the book, The Nine. It's about the Holocaust. I'm a little Jew centric. And so I was looking for Jewish references and I didn't find any. Except mm -hmm. the fact that Nicole was Jewish and your tante Hélène was Jewish. Was that purposeful or was that just not part of the story? Uh, it, it was not pur purposeful. Um, it, it was more that that's, as I started to do the research and learn about them, you know, they, they were involved in helping Jews, some of them more than others. But really their, their, their mission, and the, the re I think the reason that they joined the resistance was really to fight fascism and to fight the Nazis. Well, you just mentioned another thing that I was interested in, um, and I've never heard you answer this question. How do you join the resistance? Like, is there you know, an interview? Like, do I, where do I go? Do I write an application? Actually, How do you that's do a, that? 
That's a really good point. And that's something that Nicole talked about in her USC Shoah um, interview, because it's actually hard. You know, it was hard um, to find a, a network and where how you join. She was desperate. Nicole was desperate to join um, and for a long time looking for a way to join. And she joined as she was recruited for a moment and she had a radio in her um, barn and everything. And then that network fell apart. And then she was sort of without anywhere to join again, because one of the things about the resistance was it was very diffuse for safety. So you didn't know hardly anyone else in the resistance, just a few people you were in contact with. And if that network, network got blown. Well, how did, so so where do you, like, I know that there were people who joined Auberge de Jeunesse, right. which is like a camping group, but do right. you fill out an application? Do you tell people I want to work so in the resistance? It, it was really interesting after the war, this became, this came into play, like who was, who was bona fide, who was really in the resistance and who was claiming to have joined and who joined in the last months to be on the right side of things, you know, to black, to whitewash their collaboration, um, story. I mean, so it's very murky and muddy waters. And there were, there was a whole process that happened after the war, where you had to kind of find somebody who could testimony for you could write a letter that said, indeed, I, you know, I signed her up on this date or whatever. And and that was harder for the women to do. And um, to get to be sort of clearly uh, 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 admitted that she they had been doing all this stuff. But each one had a different kind of path to joining. And were able some and and many of the nine were pretty high up in the resistance by the time they were arrested. So they they had they, they were known to be members. People like oh, I'm 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 hearing from you that it was murky by design. Yes, it was by design. It was murky by design, and then it was very murky because many people in the end. I mean, this is a story I'm learning more and more about now. You know, so many people tried to slip into the ranks afterwards to cover up the crimes that they had. Um, committed as collaborators, and um, that's really true with the with the Dutch network. It got really complicated, like who was really in the resistance and who wasn't. And I know down here where I live, it's it's that way. Pat, you disappeared for a second. I, well, I'm back. I don't know what okay. happened, but I'm back. <laughs> okay. So let's yeah, go back. Really let's let's go back to I. You know, I mentioned in the in the introduction that you're a you were a poet. You wrote Trail of Stones. You wrote the children's authors, and all of a sudden you're writing yeah. a full novel about the Holocaust. How did yeah. that happen? Why did that happen? Well, so the I, as you know, I I met so I knew my tante Len. And one day I, uh, in 2002, I went out to lunch with her and my grandmother. She was very close to my grandmother. And during that lunch, um, she uh, suddenly told me this story about um, about her time in in in, um, in in the war and about this escape. And it was something she had never told me before, or I think really told anyone. And so I decided to record it. I went. I asked if I could come back and record it. And we did this whole day where. We did that and made a transcript, but then I left it. Um, that was kind of it, you know. To me, I had done this job, which was, um, which was figuring out the story and recording it, making sure it wasn't forgotten. It was such an astonishing story that she had to tell. And to me, I was, I wasn't really. I'm not a historian. I'm not a nonfiction writer. I mean, at that point, I was a poet and a, and a mother of young children. So I kind of let it go. And I only came back to the story really um, in around 2000. Well, there was a series of events that kept bringing me back to the story, I guess I could say. Um, um, Pat, can you see, is, can, is, uh, can everyone see me and Pat? Because I can't see Pat anymore. It's okay. Um, okay. I, I, there we go. Okay. I I'm, just want to make sure. I, I can't see me either, but I see you. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> and, just and that's sure. really what okay. I want to see. <laughs> okay. Really um, see. Um, so basically, what happened was I. So I did the thing with my Tante Hélène and we recorded the story, which had lots of holes in it, but there it was. And then two years later, strangely, I fell upon a book in French by another woman called um, Neuf Filles Jeunes Qui Ne Voulaient Pas Mourir, which seemed to say, tell the same story of nine women who escaped. And there were so many parallels to the story that my Tante Hélène had told me. Only the person that would have been my Tante Hélène was called Christine in the book. And I... So I show, took the book to her and she said, yes, indeed, that was her, that Christine was her nom de guerre and her, her code name. And Zaza, the person who wrote the book, was her good friend from high school. And this indeed was the same story. So then I had two points of view and, and Zaza's uh, account had been written right after the war. So it had a lot more details. It hadn't been published until 
20 years after her death, you know, a long time later. And so that was interesting. And then um, there was these documentary filmmakers in 2010 that contacted the family and they wanted to make a movie based on the Dutch, one of the Dutch women in the group named Lon, who had herself just written a book about the story. So then there were three points of view. And then I found another point of view, Nicole's point of view, from an article she'd written for Elle magazine. And then that is just really interesting as a writer to have, it's like a Rashomon thing. You know, you have, you have these different points of view and each one has a different, I mean, they were quite the same, but there were definitely ways that they were different. And um, also it makes the story seem more live. And then to tell you the truth, what really spurred me on was um, my daughter, Sophie, was around the same age as Hélène was when she had joined the resistance. I'm 23 or so. Yeah, and it was, two, it was um, 2016, 17. There were neo-Nazis marching in Virginia. And I felt a kind of urgency to, to try to tell this story, um, you know, about the rise of fascism and in this, my, my aunt's life and how that had. So, uh, so Sophie and I went to Germany. My, my grandfather was a German Jew who escaped from the Nazis. And that we, we have German citizenship, but we'd never really spent time there. So I, I decided to take Sophie. Well, it was her winter break and she was having a hard time. And, you know, it seemed like a good mother daughter trip. And we were going to go and go to the camp, camp where they had been and try to I would try to write an essay about it, which is something I had done. I had done sort of articles and essays. Um, but as, I never, as a little personal aside, as I'm listening yeah. to you, because I'm I'm reminded of what you said about yourself in your personal statement that you're foolish and brave. <laughs> when you were listening to your Tante Len tell the story in 19, um, I think it was 1982, uh -huh. uh, 1982, um, did you, do you have a, do you feel like, do you identify with Tante Len on some level? You know, I know, I just really admired her. I thought she was so brave so intelligent. She spoke five languages fluently. She was this engineer and she was this really elegant woman. Um, there had been a kind of tragedy in the family when I really got to know her better. And I found her way of dealing with that so remarkably um, elegant, I guess. So in more, more than that, I think I just really admired her. You know, I think I really admired her. And, and I you? thought, you know, yeah, yeah. of the nine <laughs> women, I think I don't know. I, I think I identified more with like someone like Mena, you know, uh -huh. with that, to tell you the truth. Right, right. No, it's 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 very very interesting as I'm listening to you because you mentioned even in this conversation you said I'm not a historian, and yeah. I could hear your voice in this book a lot. And you right. say a few times in the book you don't think you should be writing this book. It's really yeah. not for you to say yeah. this. Like you're almost embarrassed. And it was only when you met Odette Pipul, uh, one of the archivists, that you had this very, um, this, this, yeah. this, 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 I want to do it and I should be the person doing it. Yeah, I mean, this is really true. I felt completely like I was doing a, breaking a taboo, that this wasn't really somehow my story to tell, that I wasn't, it's also that I wasn't equipped to tell it. This is a huge subject. There's so many brilliant historians who talk about the Holocaust and the Shoah. There's so much out there. How could I, how could I do this? You know, I'd never written this kind of book before. And I also felt like, because there had been so much silence about it in my family, I often also felt like maybe my family wouldn't want me to write this. You know, like maybe that's also a taboo that I'm breaking. Um, but it's true. I had the, I mean, this, I think a lot of writers will talk about this. Um, I had this kind of weird experiences with this book where every time I would hit a wall, a door would open. It was kind of a miraculous book in that way. So one of the big um, miracles that happened for me was Odette. Um, I, I found, I had to go to the National, I, I talked myself into the, going to the National Archives because I didn't know how to do this. I'd never been to an archive, right? Mm -hmm. But I had, I have a friend who's like, oh no, just go, it's great. But you have to go online, you have to choose something to, to reserve. It, you know, there's a million things to reserve on the Holocaust. Like it, it, it's like a needle in the haystack. And so I, I, I thought, well, I'll just choose this one thing and it'll be my test run because, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. And I, you know, I got my little, you have to sign up. It's all online and registering and it's, you know, it's a the sort of bureaucracy of all the thing. And I, I chose her dossier just because she was in Leipzig. It was, a, it was one of the women who was in Leipzig whose papers were there. That was the only reason. And I go and that, and right when I went, I really was at the point of thinking, this is ridiculous. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I can't find anything out more than what I've been able to find in the first, you know, 
And suddenly her dossier came and she, there was, it, she knew, it, there was so much about that dossier that was like a treasure because she knew my Tante Hélène. She had stolen the list of the people that I was working off. She had, she was a person in her home. In fact, she deserves her own book. And in the um, final manuscript, my, my editor and I sadly cut, I think around 60 pages that were about Odette just because it didn't, you know. Yeah, it's funny, you, you know, you're mentioning like your embarrassment and, and like I said, you mentioned it quite a few times in your book. I really shouldn't be doing this. I'm, I'm not right. a historian and we're voices of hope. That's what yeah. we are. This organization that's sponsoring yeah. this talk is all about telling the story. That's right. what, that's just what we do. We tell the story. Um, you met a lot of the families of these right. nine women. Do these, did these people have a story to tell you? Well, that was, you know, also part of it. Thank you. It's a great question because I was, I was embarrassed even to uh, reach out to them. I thought, oh, they're going to say like, who is she? But every person I reached out to, every family was so happy to talk to me, so interested. Of course, they would have, almost all of them initially said, we don't know anything. They never talked about it. But then once I would sit with them and talk with them, all these things would come up. And and it was that was an incredible miracle for me as well. Just the, the kindness and generosity. I remember um, Mena's uh, son-in-law called me because I had written him a letter. I did, He didn't have email. I wrote him a letter. And I think he must have got, he must have called me immediately upon getting the letter. And he just, he said, I'm going to send you everything. And he sent me a, a folder, a big, huge manila envelope of, of photographs, you know, his photographs, not copies of them, but just, he was so, you know, he said, I don't know anything, but maybe my son knows more. And then the son sent me a few emails and then we had incredible conversations, just the generosity and the will. They, so in fact, yes. I mean, and in fact, I think the, one of the things Voices of Hope, I'm sure is, your members are very aware of is that most of the survivors are passing away now. And so we have to kind of move to the next generation of witnesses, sort of the witnesses of the witnesses. We call that guess, 3G. That's what yeah. we call it at Voices of Hope. Oh, really? Third generation. Yeah, we have a name for 3G, oh, okay. our kids. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like that's when I realized, oh, that's what I am. I'm part of that. I'm part of the, the, the person that's telling the story that was told to someone else. You know, I'm passing it along, like, like you pass a, along a long line, you know. So this theme, um, it's been repeated a lot, you know, when you talk to your parents and all of us at Voices of Hope, we all start with that theme. Well, I don't have a story to tell. Right. I have nothing to say. You know, right. um, I don't know anything. What would you say to those people who, who, who don't think they have a story? What would you tell Voices of Hope people? Like, do you have a story? Oh, yes. I mean, that the richness of the stories that people would tell me they, saying they didn't know anything were just amazing. I mean, I would be crying some of the, um, for example, talking about Mena, he told me that he, you know, he didn't know, he hardly knew his grandmother. She had died when he was only two, but he, he knew that she had made a quilt for his mother out of the coat that she wore the entire time she was in the camp. And then later she made that quilt into a teddy bear for him, which he has. You know, that is something. That is it's a story. Touching. Yeah. really powerful yeah. and then um gigi's family remembered that they had the little strips of the recipe book that she had written yeah let's you know. talk about that I, that that you know that's a, that that was that really first of all i want to tell you i laughed i cried and i had revulsion as i was reading there oh. were so many different um uh -huh. but i did laugh there yeah. were some very very funny parts and one of the funny parts and that was like really out of uh -huh. my purview completely i didn't understand um, the women wrote recipes while they were delicing other women. And they, like, how does that work? Why are starving people talking about food? Yeah, it, that was a really counterintuitive thing that I learned about. And then it opened a whole world because apparently it, this is a thing. When you're starving, you talk about food obsessively. And this has been proven in starvation studies at Harvard University and in all kinds of um, concentration camps, gulags. POW camps and um, the, the women, and I think Nicole describes it really well in her interview with the UCA. She was, she was having these auditory hallucinations when the grease in the factory where they were working would burn, she sm smelled roasted chicken and it became unbearable for her <laughs> until, until- It's a little funny. She, yeah, until she funny. described step-by-step step to her, her cl close um, you know, comrade, how she would roast a chicken and she would describe like okay I would take the chicken you know she would the, every detail or 
but really they loved um, recipes that were more like flour and sugar and butter and eggs, all that kind of rich cream, you know, bavarois, things like that. Paella. Would, I remember would, paella. Yeah, paella. And they would start, tell it by, you know, first you take an onion and then, you know, like every single step of the process, like a performance, they would recite the recipe as if they were cooking the meal for everybody, as they were getting ready for bed or delousing each other. And they could share in the meal together. It was a way of sharing food. Then they even organized Sunday meals when they had free time where they would have com competitions of who told the best, who was the best cook, in fact, which was a, a, one of the funny things was when I met uh, Zinka's son, he, he, he said, you know, my mother was anorexic. I was anorexic. She couldn't cook at all. And yet she won the award for best cook one Sunday. <laughs> But yeah. and, and I mean, there's humor. There's humor. Yeah. yeah. The other they, part, so, sorry, yeah. keep going. No, well, I, I, I'm just recalling that there's such a, a lot of wealth of funny parts in this Holocaust story that is not, it's not amusing, but there are funny parts. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm recalling the part where your Tante Hélène, she sabotaged the factory she was yeah. in. Uh, yeah. They were making Panzerfaust. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. In fact, when I, I have to say that when I, when I recorded my um, uh, my aunt's um, account, that's really where she spent the most time because it was really what she was the most proud of, um, with good reason. Um, so as I said, she was brilliant. She spoke uh, five languages fluently. She spoke German, French, Jew, um, German, French, Russian, um, uh, what Polish, else? Polish, and English. Yeah, yeah. and um, and German without an accent, and Russian probably without an accent as well because she had a Russian father. Um, she and she was an engineer so she befriended a guard he was not really a guard he was the foreman of the factory fritz stupitz i think he fell in love with her she was quite beautiful um he uh he helped her he put her in charge of the thermostats for the forge they were making the shells for the panzerfaust and they had to temper them in these forges and she was able to change the, t the temperature in the in the thermostat so that they would during the forging process the the, the temperature would go way down almost a cold, and then it would come way up at the end so that the shells would come out looking red hot, looking as if they had been properly forged, but they weren't. And that what would happen to them when they, when a soldier would try to use them is they would explode in their faces. They would, it was uh, very deadly for the, for the Germans. Mm -hmm. So the factory kept getting inspected for this because they couldn't figure out what was going wrong, you know, and they thought maybe it was the poor quality of the, of the first of the materials or something was wrong with the machines, but they never ever suspected that a woman a starving woman was capable of such sophisticated, um, uh, you know, sabotage, sabotage and got away with it. And she was able to, when they questioned her, she was able to play dumb. She was like, I don't know, I'm just supposed to put the needle to this number. And, you know, they, that, they did that a lot. They were able to use the low opinion, <laughs> the, the low opinion that the Germans had of their intelligence to their advantage, you know, like the time um, during the escape when they get the policeman at Wrightson to, to draw a map on his letterhead and then they use that map to, as if they've been given a, a laissez passer, like a, a pass, um, you know, oh, go. One of the themes of the, first of all, you have a bunch of themes running through that, but one of the themes is how these women all stuck together and yeah. also how uh, clever they were and how they use, the, the, we are in National Women's Month. So yeah. how, how, how appropriate and, um, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the times, like uh, afterwards, de Gaulle, after the, the women got the vote in 1944 in France, right. like what happened to Egalité Fraternité? I mean, where did yeah. that, you know, what yeah, happened? So you have to really, yeah, understand that, that the French women got the right to vote very late, 1944. And in fact, when France was invaded by the Nazis so quickly, Pétain, the French leader, blamed the quick loss of the French army on women on the feminists, on women wearing pants, on the whole degradation of the, the good, you know, the home and the society. And it was because of this, this sort of like, uh, you know, rotten at the core and that was all women's fault. And, um, and likewise, at the end of the war, many young women were blamed for collaborating with, not, with German soldiers, um, while many of the real black market collaborators who were men got away with it with a no, you know, with impunity. So it was a tendency to blame the women for all the oh, evil. 
but you mentioned also in your book that if you were a survivor after the war, um, it you were in, people thought you were a prostitute and yeah. um, people it it wasn't a good thing. No, in fact, that's the one of the more tragic parts about it. That and actually, Ellen sort of alluded to it as well in her interview with me. That basically they were seen as prostitutes. They were beautiful young girls. They 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 were felt everyone felt that they had been sent to. Germany to, you know, service the soldiers and that they had that then that, you know, they had, you know, that's what they had done, you know. And if a woman was from Raven's book, a lot of families called off marriages that had been planned, you know, if that was discovered, it was kind of a shameful thing. I mean, there were definitely, I, I don't want to overstate this because there were definitely people like um, Jean Mentillon and Genevieve de Gaulle who spoke out about what had happened to them in Raven's book, but they were women of a certain stature. And they had kind of their bona fide credentials as being res uh, from, from resistance families, and um, and they were and they were brave to speak out. <laughs> but there were also many, many, many women who just felt that they shouldn't say anything. That it was something that was really a taboo subject, and it would it would bring shame on the family. And and De Gaulle said, you know, he he at the end of the war he gave an award. He he named one thousand thirty eight compagnons de la libération. So these were the the great heroes of the of the resistance. And I think six were women and four were already dead. So he really, and he really said like, let the men take the glory. They've been so badly humiliated. The women need to go back, step back and go back to the home and the, go to their for former roles and let the men now, because it had been a great humiliation, of course, for France, the, how quickly the army had capitulated to the Germans. So, oh, so that was, a, and, and one last thing I'll say about this is that when Nicole in 1965 wrote her article for Elle magazine, which was a kind of a 20 years after her liberation, the liberation of, of, of the camp. She wrote um, an article about like her experience in the Holocaust and experience of the escape, but also in the camps. She, there was, she got a letter from another survivor, another woman who just excoriated her, said, you know, how dare you write about this? This is something we should never speak of. It's a shameful thing in our past. We, are, we who are the walking dead should not talk about this in grandstand. Think of all of our, our comrades who died you know, they're the ones who should get the glory, not us, you know, that kind of thing. So there was a kind of deep self-censorship. Well, I mean, we, the whole, your your entire book talks about this. This is one of the themes, this push-pull of, of yeah. being part, being a hero and not being a hero, not wanting to talk about. And you, you also talk about a little bit about how this translates into the second generation. And uh, once yeah. again, I'm bringing it up again, but Voices of Hope were a, a second generation yeah. community. Um, and we talk about, you talk about the fact that the, the none of the stories were told, but you also talk about the intergenerational trauma that seems to be passed on. Yeah, that was really a very powerful and very um, real part of the story for me that I discovered that I didn't, you know, in a way I kind of knew it because I knew Tante Hélène suffered from depression and I knew that her daughter had a lot of problems. So, and always in the family was like, well, you know, she's a child of a survivor. But then as I met the different families, um, it became a really clear theme to me that this, that this trauma is so powerful and so deeply felt in the second generation, the children of survivors. Um, partly, I mean, I don't know what the solution is. I don't have any like, oh, they should have talked more about it. I don't even know if that's true, but I think because there was a kind of silence around it, protective silence, I think the parents didn't want to talk about it because they didn't want to burden their children and because they didn't, and they wanted to go on with life and get on with things. And this was such a heavy, dark thing, but the children sensed the sadness without knowing what it was, you know, and they, 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 they were children, you, children know everything in a way, you know, and they enacted that kind of sadness. So there's so many, and I, I could say in almost every family, in fact, every, Every family that I spoke so to. So do you see, family. do you see you did so much research? I mean, this book is heavily researched, heavily archived. I mean, that's what's most impressive about it. The <laughs> incredible research is, you know, it's mind boggling. <laughs> do you see patterns in those second generation families? Yes, definitely. Tell me like, what you see. Okay. <laughs> um, well, one of the things is this kind of um, this sense that at any moment, the whole thing's going to fall apart. Like, you, you know, a sense of needing to be prepared for the worst all the time, you know, kind of. I wouldn't say paranoia, but a, a high state of alertness. Then there was also kind of a lot of them were involved in helping professions, you know, trying to, you know, there there's a lot of tendencies to be doctors or social workers, 
uh, for example, uh, Hélène's daughter was, is a social worker. And she says, uh, my, I am continuing the work of my mother. I mean, she says it right now. And when I, when I met um, Zinka's son, her, her, his son said, I'm a chef because my mother and my, my father were anorexics due to, due to that. And I'm gonna try to heal the family. So there's a sense of mission to heal as well. Um, and then there, you know, then there's the more tragic uh, ones, like um, very tragic um, Zaza's children. She lost through, through, you know, two of them committed suicide. Um, so, and it's so very tragic, like that, you know, and almost um, not able to come back from the the darkness. So yeah, I, I, and it's funny since since this has happened, you know, I've become quite close to Gigi's son, and I, you know, I see it sometimes the, in in the way that he will be ever alert for the the worst is about to happen, you know. And <laughs> we recently had we're meeting with another completely outside of my book, but another um, child of survivor. And they just immediately had the same kind of way of looking at things, you know. So you see that in us as a pattern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you see other... anything, you see anything, because you talked also to third generation people, I noticed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you got a lot of information from them. Yes. In fact, that's really was really important. To, for, what I realized is a lot of the children, the parents protected them, but they but then the grandparents, you know, grandparents, told their grandchildren. So what they wouldn't tell their children, they would tell their grandchildren is what I'm trying to say. For example, um, Gigi, the, her grandchildren had remembered that one summer she had this beautiful place where they would go in the summer and stay with her in the countryside. It's kind of an old rundown, you know, building off the side of a castle. And it was like paradise for a child. And what she would do at lunchtime is she would tell them the story of the escape, but like a cartoon, they said. It was every day was like another episode Kind of like the Odysseus, Odysseus or something. It was like a, it was a real like, and then you Homer, know Homer's Odyssey. Homer's yeah, Odyssey. right. Homer's Odyssey. And she would, and they remembered that. They remembered her just telling them, but as as a fun story, not as a not as the not as if she was in some grave danger. So they, they she was able to tell them much more than um, than she had ever told her two children. And similarly, the son of of. Uh, of Mena, the grandson of Mena had a lot more information, you know, than his father. And yeah, so I think that was, it's really interesting that that was, a, that's a big theme. The pattern, you see patterns. Yeah. So the other, the other big theme, um, like I said, uh, I see a lot of you in this, in this book, you okay. come out very strongly. You are uh -huh. not a distant writer, a journalist. I feel you very, very much in the uh -huh. book. And one of the things you talk about is, not all the Germans were bad. Right. Not all the, you know, the Russians were coming in from the East. The Americans were coming in from the West. And uh, the, the, these nine women were afraid of both of them for okay. different reasons. But, but the Americans weren't all good and the Russians weren't all good. Talk about that theme. Yeah, I mean, actually the theme of the Germans not being all bad, that was something my Alain told me because I was sort of shocked when she told me about Fritz Stupitz. And um, because one of the things she did at the end, I don't want to give this a little bit of a spoiler, but um, she at one at near the you know at the end, she filled up this car with all this food, and she found him in Germany and brought, brought brought it to his village. So I I was sort of astonished by that, and also she told me how they were found by some German soldiers who really helped them at one point, some probably um, you know soldiers who would run away, deserters. Um, and she said, yeah, everybody hated the SS. As soon as we said that we were from the SS, people would help us because they couldn't stand them. So the common German, you know, stupid, Fritz, Fritz Stupid hated the, he hated the war. He hated, he hated Hitler. He hated the SS, you know, he was forced like so many in Germany were to be part of this, um, this, you know, fascist regime, you know, you know, that's what fascism does. It oppresses all the people and you have to all behave or else. So there was definitely that was a theme that Hélène wanted me to understand when she was telling me her story. And that came up again and again. And then I think that the, you know, the sort of, um, oh, the Americans were great. And, and there, there, were, there were terrible things happen, terrible things happen in war, and especially to women. Yeah, you talked about, um, uh, it's not a well-known fact, but that the, and during the Second World War, the African-American platoons were segregated. Yeah, we talked about that. They were also. segregated, and then they were accused wrongly of of 
of raping. Whenever there was a rape, it would be put on one of the African Americans, and um, and so they very disproportionately um, charged with rape. And um, and interestingly, instead of the court martial would normally be as a four soldier, you'd be a firing squad. They would br they brought a hangman in from Texas to hang them. So they basically lynched them, these African American soldiers, um, and. And there's a lot of, I mean, there's people, um, historians who've done much better work on this, but it's, it's, it's a pretty dark part of, of the Americans. Yeah, and also, well known. Yeah, not and well also known. the American soldiers were kind of sold on this very sexualized French woman myth when they were going to France. Like all the, you know, the French women are just, you know, they're, you know, easy and just like all. Oh, oh la la, oh la la. La la, yeah. And so, so there was a large part. There was, a, in fact, there were. Um, you know, I think it was, I think it was um, Le Havre, the mayor of Le Havre said like, we, this is worse than when the Germans were here. We are, our women are being raped by the American soldiers. So it, it was pretty awful. I mean, I think the, there was bad, bad behavior. I mean, but that, that is war. And unfortunately, often it takes, there's a lot, women bear the brunt of a lot of that. Yeah, no, I, that, I want to tell you when I started crying, mm. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not a spoiler, but yeah. at the end of the book, when the, um, your women traveled all, you know, they traveled till they got to the allied, uh, mm -hmm. lines in, in France and they all no, in Germany, in, Germany. In Germany, um, and then in France, they all went to the Lutetia hotel. Mm -hmm. And of course that is relevant to me because I stayed at the Lutetia hotel. Oh, you did? Yes. Mm -hmm. By coincidence, it's, you know, uh -huh. I didn't do and all the women were there and there was chaos and everybody is going to different places and nobody said goodbye to anybody. Yeah. And my yeah. question to you is, all these women who were so bonded for so long, mm. did they ever have anything to do with each other afterwards or was they, it done? No, they did. Some of them did. So for example, Mena and Gigi stayed fast friends for life. Um, they're godmothers for each other's children and their children knew each other. Um, and which is interesting because Mena came from a really working class factory girl, you know, family. And Gigi comes from a sort of noble Dutch, you know, practically Dutch royalty. But they they stayed really, really close. And Gigi stayed very close to Lon, the other Dutch woman. And um, I think Lon stayed close to Zinka until she died and stayed close to Zaza and those that group. I think that my Tante Len stayed somewhat close to Zaza. Like there were different groups that sort of stayed in touch with each other. The the one that really disappeared for all of them was Jose and it disappeared for me too. I have to say that in the book, I had, was not able to find that. I wasn't able to find her family. I wasn't able to, to fill out her story. And just a few weeks ago, I was dri I driving through Cotton where she died. And so I went to the address of the man who signed her death certificate. He wasn't there. I left him a note. I, I'm hoping he'll contact me. I just wanted to find out like, if there's anything more I can find out about her because she's sort of an unknown for me. I mean, I was able to find her military record and some, you know, her death certificate and, you know, some things, but not really what happened to her. And and then the other one who I almost didn't find out about was, was Jose because she also kind of left the group, didn't have much contact with the group. But near the end of the writing, suddenly I found two family members, like two family members and was able to really fill out that picture, which was great. It was the last it was sort of like the month before I had to turn the manuscript in. Suddenly, I had so much information. <laughs> you mentioned, you know, like these women, you know, they met uh, in Ravensbrück and uh, they worked in uh, in um, Leipzig, Husag, and then they traveled 10 days till they, you know, it was a harrowing trip. Right, and so. um, you mentioned a few times again in your book, and I wanted to ask everybody on this call, who do you think survives longer, men or women? And I, I can't ask it to everybody, but <laughs> just for everybody to think of that, like who survives longer? And the answer is? Women, by far. Right. Um, Why? They, they, the, the really, in fact, there was, that was one of the reasons that they, um, the SS made so much more money. So the SS charged less for female labor to the German industries. But the female labor lasted longer and were, and um, yeah and was basically better. So they, um, uh, for example, the average life expectancy at a Hasag factory for a man was three months, for a woman was six months. And by the time these women escaped, they had been in that factory working there for nine months. So the other thing to say is they were really young and they had they were healthy at the start. By the time they're escaping, they're in very pitiful condition. 
Um, I think if the war had gone on another few months, some of them would have, I'm sure Jose would have died um, and possibly Zinka as well. Like they, you know, they were, they were really right at the edge of their, it was, um, their, their well, town. Jose had diphtheria, I think. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, Jackie. Yeah. Jackie had diphtheria. Jackie and Zinka had, had, had tuberculosis and Zaza had a broken foot. I mean, they all had something wrong with them. They were in really, um, not well. And, 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 uh, Mena was sort of losing her mind, um, you know, going towards the edge of, of madness you know, and had to kind of be brought back. So they, it, it, yeah, but women did, women were stronger. Um, women were stronger. They, they I, I, I hate to bring up trauma, but this is another time I cried. Um, uh -huh. You know, after a harrowing experience, these women are tortured. These women are traveling They're They don't have shoes. It's, it's like winter there. What after the war, what happened to them? Is it a pleasant story or is it a tragic story as a rule? <sighs> I, I guess it's sort of mixed. Um, I mean, life, you know, I, that's what I've learned about writing nonfiction is it doesn't quite make a nice, neat package, <laughs> you know, because it's life. Um, there's, uh, for example, Zaza's story has is incredibly tragic in a way. Her children is tragic. But at the end of her, she married another survivor who was deeply traumatized. And, um, but by the end, and she became handicapped. She was in a wheelchair. And in the end of her life, that marriage, which had been a bad marriage, difficult marriage, unhappy marriage, children, probably so many problems, they found each other again. And I think he found him, her because he had to care for her. He sort of came back to her and they got a camping car and they, and they had two gigantic dogs. And apparently they traveled all over Central Asia and North Africa, you know, and ha happily. So is that a happy or sad? You know, she has... They have this very sad story with their children, but they were able to find each other at the very end of their lives um, and had 10 years of a happy marriage at the end. Well, I, 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 so I don't know. It's all, it's and like, and then married uh, my, taunt, my uncle, Danny, who was a great war hero. I think they had a great marriage, but she had, she suffered from depression near the end of her life. You know, it's hard to say. It, as you said, it's not neat and clean. Yeah. But um, you know what, um, Gwen, I want to thank you very much for uh, chatting with me and with well, thank you. Chat, chatting with Voices of Hope. And like I said, the book is, is it's a beautiful book. And it's, it's I was, it, it made me laugh, cry, revulsion <laughs> for what's going on. But now we yeah. have some questions okay. from the audience if they're in the chat room. And um, I want to also thank our professional staff, notably uh, Robin Landau and Sarah Snyder, who have facilitated this entire talk and, and also uh, the, the leadership of uh, Voices of Hope. It's a great organization and um, we're doing good work. Yeah, in fact, I wanted to thank you for inviting me. I didn't say that at the beginning. <laughs> well, you're going to have a chance. You're going to have a chance to thank you because we're going to transition now to okay. Robin Landau, who is head of operations, and she's going to field the questions. So okay. um, thank you. Thank you, Gwen. And uh... okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Pat. And thank you, Gwen. This has been so fascinating and we do have a bunch of questions so i'm just going to jump right in okay um so one um someone is asking were there many non-resistance heroes who aided these women in their resistance work and subsequent escape so people who were not involved necessarily uh-huh um i think probably a little bit in 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 the camps yes um, and definitely in the escape. I don't know, I can't really speak to whether they were, they were helped by non-resistance people yes. in their actual resistance work. Um, but I can say that um, in, during the escape, they ran mm -hmm. into all kinds and it was kind of a, a theme. They, they ran into people who were very kind, Germans who were kind to them and they ran into terrible, dangerous Germans and they ran into Germans that realized the, the winds of, were, of war were changing and that they better get on the right side. So they were nice to them begrudgingly. Um, and helpful that way. Um, so it, you know, I think there were all that, but in the, I think in the camp, one of the, we sort of alluded to that a little bit that the women survived. And I, I think one of the reasons that the women had a higher level of survival was they had actually a pretty strong network of solidarity. Um, so 
you know, in the in the same camp with them, in the same bunker with them, there would be um, what was called asocial, so like sex workers, prostitutes, or um, wit vagrants, or um, petty criminals, and they would be helpful at times. I mean, I think that they 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 there were some beautiful stories about all kinds of women who had gotten swept up by the Nazis. Um, you know, also, you know, that the Nazis arrested women for, you know, race shaming. That would be some, a German who slept with a Jew or, um, or also there were this Roma and Sinti people. So there were, there were all different kinds of women in the camp. And, and I think that they were able, at least in Leipzig, to show kind of solidarity and help each other out to, to resist. And they did resistance in really interesting ways too. I mean, they had, that one of the things was that, for example, they would celebrate each other's birthdays. They would, and they would be able to, do really uh, astonishing things with so little so to keep each other's spirits up right and i think that's really important when you when we hear about resistance right that there's all different ways to resist and yeah, so absolutely. many and, and they and they kept at it while they right. were there from celebrating birthdays to um to um creating issues in the factory while they were working. Right, right. right. And, you know, there, there was a very famous one that I, I, this account I found in so many different accounts. So it wasn't just my group of nine. It was, I found it across the board. There was a, the thing called um, St. Catherine's Day, which was a tradition that had been kind of dying out in France where unmarried women would wear crazy hats and dance around the, in the streets of their villages, right? right? But it had stayed kind of a thing in Paris amongst the haute couturier, like the really high-end fashion um, seamstresses. There was a whole group of them in Leipzig and in Ravensbrück, and they created amazing hats for the women, for the unmarried girls that one St. Catherine's Day, out of which was crazy because they had to make it out of nothing, out of pieces of their ma mattresses and stuff. And the descriptions of what they made were astonishing. And then the, the girl, the women danced with these hats and all the different blo blocks uh, joined in, even the guards. And it was a moment when they were human and, and not just slaves. Um, you mentioned um, with the last question that there were, um, that some people helped because they were nervous. They saw the tides changing and they knew what was going to happen after the war. There's a, there's a part in the book where you talk about the women giving um, their triangles. Yeah. People. So I had not heard of that before. Could you, um, was, was that something that was done a lot at the time yeah i mean i think i don't know if, how much but yeah so they had these they had their red um because they were they were political prisoners and um the two that were jewish had kept that hidden from the nazis so they had all the red triangle and they had the f in their red triangle as, as french political prisoners because they were all arrested in france and i think when people helped them and they were worried about what was coming you know um the sort of reprisals um, sometimes the, they would ask, or maybe the woman would offer, and they would give them one of their triangles and they would sign the back and then they, they would say, on this day, this person helps the, us, the group of nine women, da, 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 da. you know, so they would have like this, this proof that they could show if they were arrested afterwards by military police or charged with, um, with being, you know, a Nazi uh, criminal, war crimes. It's, you, what it, you get to is how completely complicated and messy it becomes. Because also in Revan's book, you know, you had women who were arrested maybe as criminals or, you know, maybe as prostitutes or maybe as resistance, fight, whatever. And then they, in the camp, it transformed people. So they, some of them became very brutal. Right. And, um, and then there were prostitutes who were afterwards ch went back to France and then were charged with having slept with German soldiers and were, you know, had to have the political prisoners step up for them. So one of, uh, I think, um, I'm trying to remember who stepped up. I think it might've been uh, Zaza who spoke on, on the behalf of a woman who had been a prostitute, who she shared a cell with, who was being tried for collaborating with German soldiers after having spent um, two years in a concentration camp. Wow. We actually have um, a comment from, I can't see, from Marcy Bloom. Yep, I got the name right. Marcy Bloom. Thank you, Marcy, who says, thank you for this excellent discussion. The 2002 book by, I'm going to butcher this name, but by Fabrici Vergli, Shorn Women, Gender and Punishment in Liberation France is another resource 
which explores the acts of revenge perpetrated against innocent women who were accused of sexual involvement with the Germans. So yeah. if people are interested in that. Yeah, that's a great book. It was one of the books I read for the, this yeah. book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that they, that two of these nine women were Jewish. Yeah. How yeah. did they hide that? Well, you know, my, my, my Tante Len came from a very, you know, assimilated family. So non-practicing. Um, and uh, I think for her, she, she changed her name to Christine. I think her last name was Podlyaski, but she said she was Polish Catholic. You know, she, 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 um, tried to pass it off that way. And I think that they didn't, some, she must have faked papers or whatever. It, she, it never came up really in a way, in a way her, her family wasn't known as, you know, in a, in the, in a community as being clearly Jewish. Um, Nicole, uh, on the other hand, her family had to flee, um, had to flee Paris and her, her brother was almost rounded up. Her father was almost rounded up. She lived in kind of constant fear that her, her family would be swept up. And, and partly I think that anger, um, of that was what motivated her to join them. That was one of the, the she was so enraged by the um, anti-Semitism and stunned by it in a way, like this sudden, you know, she, there they thought they were in the land of, um, you know, France that accepted all these German Jewish uh, refugees as Nazism wrote, was coming to power in Germany in the early thirties. And suddenly all of those people were in danger. So, um, she was able to hide it by, you know, she was actually arrested on a different name. She had like five different IDs and she was named, um, she was arrested under the name of Nicole Audibert. Her real name is Levi Clarence, but they didn't, that, that took, that, that was one of the reasons it was very hard for me to find her at first in the records because mm -hmm. she didn't even have her, she had changed her name. Right. All right, we have time for one uh, last question, and this is from Rob, and he said he believes you retraced the escape route. Um, who did you do that with, and and how and how was that for you? Yeah, I did. I retraced it. So the first time I went with my daughter Sophie, and I completely botched it up because we had the everything wrong. I thought that they had gone to Buchenwald. They hadn't. You know, it's this whole thing. Um, and then I I retraced it. I mean, I can show. you. Well, I did it myself. Um, by basically going there because um, I slowly was able to figure out the names of the towns that they had, they, in the different accounts that I was, that I was gathering, they named different German towns, sometimes misspelled, and then just staring at the map and Google map and then driving there actually made me find towns that I hadn't been able to find. And some of the buildings I found was, I was able to find some of the actual buildings where they mentioned in their accounts. So um, yeah, no, that was, um, that was a whole, I did it, it took me three times. I went to Germany three times. The first time it completely didn't work. The second time I got a lot more clarity on it. And then the third time I went with my sister and um, and uh, it, it was, you know, my sister and I were, were, we were very uh, meticulous. We were able to find what one, one of the things that came became quite clear was the women were in such bad shape that they weren't really traveling very far each day, maybe five kilometers on foot. So the towns were quite close together sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, you know, that, so it was interesting to trace their route that way. Um, yeah, I, I haven't, I can show a map. I don't know. Should... Yeah, why don't we look at a map and then I'm going to ask you to share one more thing before we wrap up. So if you could yeah, let me see if I can map. find it. Let's see, it's in here. Um, sorry, I'm just the, where, what is it? the map. There it is. Is this the right map? Yeah. Can you see that? We cannot. Ah, you can't see it. Okay. No. Stop share and then try again. Okay. Okay. Now I'll do that. Stop share and then I'm going to try again. <laughs> Give it one more shot. Okay. There we go. Share this one. Full screen. Ah, that's ah, there's, yeah. there's the map. So they, they came south from Ravensburg to Leipzig is where they worked. They marched to Wurzen and then to Oschatz with the, with, on the death march. And that was uh, basically 60 kilometers, almost nonstop. And then somewhere near Oschatz, they escape. And then those little towns are where they were able to find food or shelter or, um, you know, some help. And then they crossed the Mulder River at Klosterbock, Rock, and then um, traveled up near Leisnig. And then they found the U.S. soldiers right after Leisnig. And the soldiers took them to Colditz. Wow. Later they go to grandma. Anyway. This. 
and that's so would you mind um we're, we're gonna wrap up but I just think it's really important. You have a picture of the nine women. I think yeah. we would love to see the picture of these okay. brave women. Yeah, here it is um, on the current slide. There you go. Can you see it? Yes, and if you wanna tell us. So yeah, so that's the nine. So in the top left-hand corner, I think it'll be left-hand corner. <laughs> the top corner is my Tante Len. And uh, below her a little bit is, that's Jackie the oldest woman in the group who was 29 at the time of the escape. And then below her is Lon, who's the other Dutch woman. And then the next two are Mena and, and um, Gigi the, is the other Dutch woman. And Mena is those two became, were friends forever. The real, that's beautiful woman is Jose. That's the Spaniard. She was the youngest in the group. She was 20. Below her is Zinka. And then there is um, Nicole in the top right. And then below on the very bottom corner, there is Zaza. Well, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, we have I, we have one more um, comment, which I which I'm hoping I'm going to um, connect the two. We have a uh, Pepe Margolis is saying that by chance, her father was in the same ammunition factory and labor camp that was mentioned in your book. Um, and there is a Nazi officer, Hans Lofer, or Lofer, and uh, who, who saved her father. So it, I'm going to ask if I can connect the two of you sure. offline. So okay. I will connect the two of you offline and, and you guys okay. can, can talk about it. So Please join me in thanking Gwen. This is a remarkable story. And thanks to everyone in our audience for your ongoing support, your amazing questions, um, and all the connections that we've made. Um, this was program was uh, brought to us thanks to our affiliation with the Jewish Book Council. Um, if you'd like to purchase a copy of Gwen's book, The Nine, The True Story of a Band of Women Who Survived the Worst of Nazi Germany, there is a link in the chat. Um, and in addition, Gwen uh, shared with me that today is the last day that if you are interested in purchasing the ebook from Amazon, it is on sale for $2.99 in honor yeah. of Women's History Month. Um, and just real quickly, we have some um, upcoming events um, at the Manda JCC and the Emanuel Synagogue. We have our community wide Yom HaShoah commemoration on Sunday, April 24th at 6 p.m. Uh, where we will hear the names of those local community members who perished during the Shoah and those of our departed survivor. Uh, this commemoration begins at 7 p.m. and there'll be an option to live stream or to go in person. And then the following day, we will um, have a community-wide reading of the names at the Mandel JCC. Um, and there is a link in the chat where you can sign up if you are interested in reading names during that day. Um, our next speaker series event will be on May 1st. Um, it's a book called My Survivor, A Girl <coughs> on Schindler's List. And this is a Yom HaShoah program for uh, young professionals in partnership with Jew Good Hartford. So the next community-wide program will be on May 16th. We will be welcoming Anna Salton Eisen, author of Pillar of Salt, A Daughter's Life in the Shadow of the Holocaust. Um, and if you liked the program today, you can check out our voice, uh, our, our, our website for all of our upcoming events. And please consider making a donation at www.ctvoicesofhope.org. Uh, you can use our text to give number or even Venmo. And those are all um, online. Um, we are going to try to initiate a poll, but I, I'm not sure it's going to work. So if if it doesn't, we will have a poll at our next event. Um, Gwen, thank you so much. And I just want to repeat that Gwen is joining us all the way from, from France. So, Well, really, it's my honor and my privilege. And thank you so much. Thank you for all the participants. And really, Pat, thank you for the wonderful conversation. Yes, I'm Pat, really thank honored you. And grateful. Yes, thank you. thank you, Pat. Put a, one, on a huge amount of time and effort into this, and it was really wonderful. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your, of your day. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.